Hello, my name is Shannon Stanley and I'm going to be taking you through a lecture today on infection control. So to start off with, we'll have a look at the contents that we're going to cover in this next section. Firstly, we'll talk about the different type of infectious agents that are out there that lead to somebody obtaining a disease, how disease is transmitted from one person to another. Um, this occurs through the chain of infection and uh, understanding the chain of infection is highly important uh, for the work that we do, especially when it comes to procedures of infection control, uh, because through these infection control procedures, this is how we can stop infection spreading from one person to another. Infectious agents are biological agents that can cause infection and disease. Organisms are said to be pathogenic, and what this means is that they are considered to be the origin of most diseases. The different types of infectious agents are bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. So bacteria are the first pathogenic agent that we're going to be having a look at, and you can see there's a picture of what bacteria look like underneath a microscope um, down in the right-hand corner. From the picture, you can see that they're quite simple in structure, and they're only one cell large or what they call as unicellular organisms and they are spread right throughout our environments. They have the ability of living independently of other organisms and what that means is that bacteria do not need a human or animal host to survive. They're quite happy to um, survive and breed and replicate on any kind of object. So that could be something um, like a desk or the shower floor or a mobile phone or money, for example. Um, so they do not need a human or animal host to survive or live off. Bacteria are treated by antibiotics or bacterial infections are treated with antibiotics. Um, and there's a very big misconception in the community of why antibiotics are used uh, to treat certain things and not. Most people believe that antibiotics are there to treat any type of infection um, that a human gets and that's not true. It's only for bacterial infections. Most bacteria are actually very useful and only some are said to be pathogenic. So we have millions of bacteria living on our skin um, and the whole way through our digestive tract um, and they're very very helpful for a number of different reasons and using an example here is we have quite a lot of bacteria right through our gastrointestinal tract and they're very important for aiding in digestion but if they move out of the digestive tract into another cavity or into another place such as the um, peritoneum they can cause a very serious infection and this is exactly the same like we have bacteria inside of our mouth or our oral cavity and the bacteria has a very important and function there but if that bacteria goes to another area such as your lungs um, that can cause things like bacterial pneumonia um, which are pretty severe so a couple of examples of different type of bacterial infections is e coli salmonella streptococcus uh, TB or tuberculosis, tetanus, syphilis and thrush. And you'll notice that with a lot of medical conditions um, or diseases, you might have a bacterial infection with that and a viral infection, so caused by different things. Example of this is meningitis. So meningitis, which is inflammation of the meninges running around the brain and spinal cord, is a very serious condition and it can be caused by a bacterial infection and a viral infection and then it'll be defined as bacterial meningitis or viral meningitis. Viruses are very different to bacteria in their shape, structure and functions. Unlike bacteria, a virus cannot survive without a susceptible host and it cannot live independently from a host either. Viruses are known to be intracellular parasites, and this is due to the nature of how they function. So once they've invaded an organism, they actually use the organism's cell to hide away from the natural defenses of that organism and to multiply. This makes them incredibly difficult to treat because once a virus invades the cell, it can only be killed by destroying the whole cell. And this has resulted to all current treatments of any type of viral infection um, is solely aimed at treating the symptoms of that virus and not about destroying the virus itself. 
viruses can mutate and so they become very resistant to drugs and medications. Um, so the main defense against our viruses are actually vaccinations and inoculations. Common different types of viruses are um, things like the common colds, chickenpox, measles, mumps, rubella, certain types of pneumonia, the Ebola virus, which has been very big in the news as of late, and uh, the AIDS or HIV virus. Fungi are a different type of infectious agent um, that, again, is different to viruses and bacteria and its shape, structure, and its nature. Um, fungi are organisms that are more like plants than animals, and these include uh, yeasts and molds. Fungi can be present in soil, air, and water. So fungi are very different to bacteria and viruses in the sense that they are very happy living independently of any kind of human or animal host. Um, but when they do come into contact with a human or an animal host, they're a, a pathogen that causes a very slow development of a disease. Um, they're usually more mildly irritating compared to being fatal. Um, the only cases where fungi can cause more severe effects is in patients um, that have very low or impaired immune systems. For example, in an HIV patient with a very low immune system, uh, fungi can invade the lungs, the blood, and several organs and have quite detrimental effects um, on those types of patients. Examples of different kind of fungi uh, infections are things like ringworm, athlete's foot, and thrush. The last type of pathogenic agent we're going to have a look at are parasites. So parasites need to live and to feed off other organisms. They don't live very well independently of organisms, only for very short periods of time. They can cause mildly annoying to very fatal diseases. Most worm infections are spread via feces um, that contaminate food and water sources. And the most common places that practitioners will see this is in developing countries where there's inadequate supply of fresh and clean water sources and of good sanitation practices. Different types of examples of parasites are things like roundworms, pinworms, hookworms, flatworms, and tapeworms and flukes. Now these would be causing more um, minor infections in an individual but you can get very severe infections such as Bilharzia infections without treatment um, that can be fatal. In this next section, we'll be having a look at disease transmission and control. So first off, we'll discuss the different modes of transmission and the chain of infection. And then we'll have a look at different infection control methods and the importance of using things such as personal protective equipment, how to dispose of contaminated waste products and managing needle stick injuries. In order for a disease or a pathogen to um, be spread from one person to another or from an animal to another, it needs to have a mode of transmission. The first type of mode of transmission is through direct or physical contact. Now, this is one of the easiest ways for a pathogen to enter into the human body because it bypasses a lot of the body's natural defense mechanisms. So examples of this would be through oral contact, through contact through the eye, intravascular injections, uh, fecal contamination, and through sexual contact. Another mode of transmission is through what's called indirect contact. So this is where something has not immediately been passed from one body source to another. An example of this would be um, if somebody was to sneeze onto a table surface or somebody was to cough an infectious agent onto a table surface and the infectious agent could live outside that host for a while. Another person would come along and touch that surface and maybe wipe their nose or rub their eye or even touch their mouth. And this would be a portal then for an infectious agent to enter into their body. So this is not direct contact. The organism needs to survive on an animate or inanimate object for a time without a human host. The next and very effective mode of transmission is through droplet transmission. So all those people who don't cover their mouths um, or cover up their noses when they sneeze or cough um, have the ability to 
spread infection through the droplets that they cough or sneeze out of their bodies and somebody else would breathe that in and that would cause transmission of the disease. Infections and diseases can only spread when the conditions are right. So we call these set of conditions the chain of infection. There are six links to the chain of infection and all of these need to be intact in order for the spread of infection to occur from one organism to another. The first is the pathogenic agent. So examples of this is a bacteria, virus, fungi, or parasite. So this needs to be present in order for an infection to take place. The next is the reservoir. This reservoir source is where the infectious agent can normally live and multiply. And examples of this can be a human, animal, insect, um, in the soil, or any kind of contaminated food or water source. There need to be a portal of exit. So this organism needs to move, uh, sorry, this pathogenic agent needs to move from one reservoir source or organism to another. So it can exit via things like the respiratory tract, intestinal tract, through sexual contact, open wounds, blood or bodily fluids. There needs to be an environment conducive for the mode of transmission. So this can be either through direct, indirect contact or through droplet transmission. Then there needs to be a portal of entry into the new organism. Um, and, uh, infectious agent can enter into the new organism via things like the respiratory tract, intestinal tract, um, through sexual contact, open wounds and mucous membranes such as the eye or mouth. The last link in the chain of infection is the host susceptibility. So this determines whether somebody um, will or will not get infected by this pathogenic agent that has been passed from one individual to another. Things that can affect the host susceptibility um, are age. So for the very young and the very old or debilitated um, would have a generally low immune system and a low ability to fight off infections. Those who are immunocompromised due to poor nutrition or health, um, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, um, and different types of medical conditions would naturally have a lower immune system and find it harder to fight off these infectious agents. So again, all of these elements need to be intact in order for infection to spread from one individual or one source to another. Infection control practices are very important for breaking the chain in the spread of disease. Some important infection control practices include effective hand washing, personal hygiene, and cleaning and disinfecting of our equipment. The first infection control procedure we'll have a look at is effective hand washing. Now, as medical practitioners, we're gonna be coming into contact with many different types of patients. Some patients may be highly infectious and have infective agents on their skin or in the atmosphere around them, and other patients might be very immunocompromised. And it's important that we as medical practitioners are not aiding the transmission of disease. So we need to follow procedures like effective hand washing. So very important, we wash our hands before and after contact with every single patient. We need to make sure that we have soap and running water and as well as some disposable towels at the end to dry our hands with. I'm gonna give you a few seconds to have a look at the chart in front of you. Read through all the instructions carefully and then we'll move on to the next slide. Personal hygiene is another important aspect of infection control and by practicing good personal hygiene practices, we also help to break the chain of infection. So very important to wear a clean uniform with each and every shift. Ensure that nails are kept short and clean, um, and this means no artificial nails either. Artificial nails, long nails, and excessive jewelry is a breeding ground for bacteria, and often these areas are not cleaned appropriately when performing the good hand washing techniques. So it's very important to keep nails short, no artificial nails and no excessive jewelry. And again, just ensure that you're washing hands before and after contact with every patient. 
Cleaning and disinfection is just as important as personal hygiene and hand washing. It's important that you clean all personal and ambulance equipment after use with each patient. The cleaning detergent or disinfection solution will be provided to you and approved of by your service. Ensure that you're also cleaning the inside and the outside of your ambulance after each shift or after you've had a highly infectious patient. As a medical practitioner or healthcare provider, personal protective equipment make up part of your uniform. Personal protective equipment or PPE consists of gloves, masks, safety glasses, and clothing or your uniform. Gloves make up the most important part of your personal protective equipment when attending to cases. Um, gloves provide that extra barrier between your skin and the patient and this helps to ensure that your skin isn't exposed to um, as many bacteria and viruses as it would be if you were to not be wearing gloves. So we make sure that we use a pair of gloves with every single patient and this is a single use only. Now, Keep in mind that when we are using gloves, regardless of whether a patient is bleeding, has bodily fluids, is highly infectious or not, um, that you are protecting yourself by using a pair of gloves, but you're also protecting immunocompromised patients from anything that you may be carrying as well. Gloves must meet the government regulations and specifications set out by Australian standards. and. Um, Whenever you are removing a pair of gloves, it's very important to ensure that you're turning them inside out. And in this way, if your gloves are contaminated with any waste products, you're confining it to a certain area when you're disposing of them. Ensure that you also use gloves when you're cleaning your equipment and your vehicle um, because they have been contaminated and when you are cleaning your gear, um, if you just wear a pair of gloves while doing that, you're also just adding that extra protection to yourself. And lastly, just make sure that you are washing your hands after you remove your gloves every time. Masks and goggles or safety glasses are very important for providing protection to your eyes and mouth. Um, and it provides protection against things such as saliva, blood spray, um, vomitus, or any other type of body fluids. Um, the eyes and the mouth are an easy portal of entry for an infection into the body, so it provides a barrier from, and stops that from occurring. So very important to keep your safety goggles on you at all times, uh, particularly when you're anticipating any splashes of bodily fluids or blood. Immunizations also help protect you against many of the pathogens that you'll come into contact with as a healthcare provider. The different immunizations would help protect you against things such as hepatitis A and B, tetanus, the flu virus, and you may also get the triple antigen which is protecting you against diphtheria, tetanus and whooping cough. Depending on where you work, your organization may require you to have some or all of these or even more of these um, to ensure that you can work safely in your work environment. Exposure. If blood or body substances gets into contact with the skin, then watch that exposed site with soap and water. Wherever there's no water available, use a non-water-based cleanser such as an alcohol solution or an antiseptic solution. If blood or other body substances gets into the eyes, rinse them thoroughly with water or normal saline. Do not use any harsh chemicals on the eyes. If blood or other body substances gets into the mouth, then spit them out and rinse the mouth thoroughly several times with water. Needle stick injuries have the capacity to spread infections such as hepatitis or HIV or AIDS virus. In the event of a needle stick injury occurring, you need to wash the injured area with copious amounts of soapy water, disinfectant, scrub solution, or just water if that's all you have. Ensure you report the incident, document it effectively, and dispose of the sharps safely. Waste needs to be disposed of appropriately and effectively. Needles and sharps need to go into a sharps container only. Needles and sharps are not allowed to, or should not go into any normal waste bin or any contaminated waste bin besides a sharps container. 
Other self-contaminated waste needs to be disposed of in contamination waste bags. This includes any product that has blood